Okay, so hello everybody, I'm Emilian Delmont, I'm a neurologist, I work in Marseille, in France, in a referral center for neuromuscular disorders and ALS, and today I'm going to talk about diagnosis and treatment of CIDP associated with antibodies against the node of Ranvier. So you know that... Uh, sorry? In the peripheral nerve system, you have large and small axons, and when you have large axons, there is one Schwann cell, and uh, you have the myelin, and here the node of Ranvier, and you have a conduction, which is saltatory from nodes of Ranvier to other nodes of Ranvier. If you zoom here at the nodes, you can see that there are several parts. The first one is the node, where you have sodium channel, here it's the paranode with paranodal myelin loops, and here the juxta paranode. In the juxta paranode, you have potassium channel. It's because the sodium and potassium channel are separated that uh, the depolarization is very limited to a small area and that you can have a saltatory conduction. But there is a need to have a fence here in the juxtaparanode between the node and the juxtaparanode here on the paranode and this fence is made with glycoprotein and you have the neurofacin 155 here which is expressed by the Schwann cell here you have the Schwann cell here you have the axon here it's the paranode here the node and here the juxtaparanode and on the neural um, position, you have Casper 1 and Contactin 1, which are here. And here you have the fans that um, block uh, the two parts, the two different parts. Uh, in, in 2012, uh, there is a good paper about antibodies against Neurofacin 155. In 2013, a paper about antibodies against contactin, 2016 about Casper 1, and in 2017 we published a paper about antibodies against neurofacin 186. So you can see that all these papers are not too old and that it's a new topic. Let's talk about first about antibodies against contactin 1. These antibodies have been described by neurologists from Spain in Barcelona, Luis Carroll and Isabel Hila. And they screen uh, a bank of sera, and they screen this serum on hippocampal neuron culture. You can see here an, hippo, an hippocampal neuron. And some of the sera stain this neuron and uh, recognize the contact in one which was very interesting is that these three CIDP patients had common clinical features, which were advanced age, predominantly motor involvement, aggressive symptom onset, early axonal involvement, and poor response to intravenous immunoglobulins. Then, a more detailed um, study about antibodies against neurofacin 155 by Jerome Deveau. Uh, in this uh, paper, they screened a bank of sera of 533 CIDP, and they found these antibodies in 7% of all the CIDP patients. Um, what you have to remember is that these antibodies are always of a very specific isotype. It is IgG, but IgG4 just IgG4, which are pathogenic. And these patients were young, they had sensory ataxia, they had postural tremor, and some of these patients had dominating lesion in the CNS. And so here you can see hyperintensity of the corpus caiusus and your periventricular hyperintensity that can mimic uh, multiple sclerosis. It's rare to have this feature, to have a double diminution in the central and peripheral nerve system, and it seems that uh, Japanese guys are more involved. The patient with antibodies against neurofacin 155 have always poor response to IVIG, 
And here you can see that it is a dominating neuropathy because you have a prolonged distal latency, uh, disper temporal dispersion. If we compare antibodies against neurofacin 155 and against contactin 1, you can see that there are not too much patients who have been published, less than 100 patients for neurofacin, and I think that nowadays it, it must be 30 patients or something like that for antibodies against contactin 1. Patients with antibodies against neurofacin are younger and they have postural tremor. Patient with antibodies against contactin 1 had a sensor, have a sensory ataxia, and in both populations, you have a clear resistance to IVIG, which is the first treatment of CIDP in Europe. So it's very important to discover this, uh, these antibodies because if you know that your patient don't have, have these antibodies, the first line therapy is not IVIG. How is the electrophysiology in the CIDP? These are uh, personal data. Uh, 30 patients with IgG4 antibodies against neurofacin 155 and five patients with antibody uh, against contactin 1. In this patient, all met the EFNS, PNS diagnostic criteria for CIDP. And on the left, you can see one example of a 53-year-old man with antibodies against contactin 1. You can see that he has a clear dominating neuropathy. Uh, you have a small decrease of, of, you have a decrease of the simal amplitude, but the nerve conduction uh, abnormality are clear. Here you have a distal latency of 10 millisecond. Uh, normal for us is 4 millisecond. Here you have a temporal dispersion between the stimulation at twist and elbow with an increase of the duration of the potential of more than 40%. And here between axilla and elbow, there is a reduction of the velocity to 27 meter per second and the normal is 50 meter per second. Here an example, it's always on the median nerve of the latency of the F waves and the, here the latency is 75 millisecond and the normal is 30 millisecond. So a clearly dominating neuropathy. And we compare uh, this uh, 30 patient and five patient to 40 uh, CIDP patient from our department who didn't have any antibodies against neurofacin or contactin, and there were no clear difference between the nerve conduction study, and in both cases, with or without antibodies, the neuropathy was dominating, and there were not spe specific features that can permit to, to know that patient had or don't have this kind of antibodies. The nerve biopsy. Usually in CIDP, you have cellular infiltration and onion bulb formation. These are features that uh, we don't see in patients with antibodies against neurofacin and contactin. Here it's a picture from Koike and here a picture from Vala. You can see in this uh, microscopy, el um, electron microscopy that small axons are normal. Here you have small axons with one Schwann cell and here you have others. And here you have large axon. Here you can see one Schwann cell. Um, you see that the myelin is very thin, is too thin. So there is um, a trouble of the myelinization of this axon. Here it's a normal axon and you are just in the paranodal region where there is paranodal myelin book, um, loops. Here you can see the loops. And here you have some transverse band, which are the glycoprotein that make a bridge between the Schwann cell and here the exon. And when you look at the biopsy of patient with antibodies against neurofacin or contactin, you can see that here you have a loss of this transverse band. Here are the myelin, the myelin loops, here is the axon, but there is no more the transverse, the transverse band.
So what's happened? You have the antibody that make a dismantling of the, of the node of front VA. You have enlargement of the node. This is picture from Koike. Here you see the paranodal loops. Normal, normally you have a, con a saltatory conduction, but if the node of front VA is enlarged, you don't have any more the saltatory conduction, and so you have abnormality of the nerve conduction, and you can have a demilinating feature on the nerve conduction study. Are these antibodies really pathogenic? We don't have too much information about that. One of the best papers, one from uh, Manso and uh, Jérôme Deveau, they inject IgG4 from a patient, IgG4 who reacts uh, against the contactin 1 in a sciatic nerve. So here you see that they inject these antibodies, which are labeled in green, and they labeled the paranoid with, antibody, with a monoclonal antibody against contactin 1, which is in red, and here in blue, the sodium channel. So this is a node. When you merge everything, you can see that here is a node. Here you have the antibody of the patient which have been injected in the sciatic nerve, and here there is the contactin 1, which is uh, at the level of the uh, uh, the level of the paranoid. Three days after what's happening, you can see that the antibodies penetrate in the juxtaparanode. You see here the staining is larger than here, and there is a merge between the red of the, con uh, of the uh, contactin 1 and the green of the antibody, and you have here the yellow, which uh, means that the antibodies are penetrating into the juxtaparanodal region. One more experiment to prove that these antibodies are pathogenic is experimental allergic nevritis. This is a model of Guillain-Barré syndrome. You immunize Lewis rat with P2, and here you can see uh, the clinical grade of the neuritis. Five days after the immunization, the rat are, uh, are ill, they express they have a nevritis. And after, the nevritis uh, is improving and the rat uh, become normal, like in, in Guillain-Barré syndrome. But if you inject in the same time antibodies against uh, contactin 1, you can see here, that the nevritis is becoming chronic and it, uh, it's chronic and more severe. If you inject IgG1, it's less severe than if, if you inject IgG4, like in uh, the patient with CIDP and antibodies against the node of frontier. The treatment. You know that the patient with this kind of antibodies has poor response, response to IVIG. Plasma exchange and steroids can be efficient, but this uh, patient usually resists to all the treatment, and uh, sometimes they are well reacting with immunosuppressant drug like rituximab. This is a study from Louis Carroll who show that. Um, after injection of rituximab, uh, there were three patients, I think, that uh, were uh, improving. So this is the, the RODS score. Zero is severe, and when you have 50, it's normal. So you can see that after the injection of rituximab, the RODS is improving, and the ONLS, which is an incapacity scale, is, dec uh, is decreasing, uh, decrease. When you have 10, it means that you can't move your leg or can't move your arm. And when you have, um, uh, sorry, it's, it's, the, uh, uh, it's the opposite. And when you have zero here, the ONLS, when it is zero, the, the patient is normal. So injection here of rituximab, improvement of RODS and improvement of ONLS. 
If we look at the titer of the antibodies, here the injection, there is a clear decrease of the titer of antibodies against contactin 1. It's usual that after rituximab, we can't measure this antibody anymore. And you see here it's uh, antibodies against tetanus toxin, which remain stable. So rituximab seems to be a good treatment for this patient. I show you one video of a patient with antibody against uh, neurofacin 155. You can see that he has a postural tremor. It was very hard for him to drink a glass of water. And here, I think it was six months after the rituximab therapy, you can see that he's in good fit and that he can drink his glass of water very easily. So it's really good response of rituximab in this patient. He don't have any more uh, sensory ataxia and the tremor is no more there. Let's talk about the other antibody uh, di directed against other protein of the node of Rangier. We're gonna talk first of neurofacin 186. Um, the discovery of this antibody was made uh, from one patient of the department. It was a 61-year-old man who had in April 2014 for, uh, bronchitis and a sore throat. In May, he expressed uh, paresthesia of the four limbs and the sensory ataxia. And in September, he was bedridden with cranial involvement, nerve involvement. He was unable to swallow and he had um, bilateral facial palsy. The uh, nerve conduction study showed dominating neuropathy. He had high uh, protein ratio, 1.8 gram per liter. Here it is um, motor evoked potential with triple stimulation, which uh, permit to study the region between uh, the cervical roots and the herbs points. And here you can see that there is an amplitude reduction of 34%. So that is a proximal conduction block. Here you have one uh, sample of his uh, nerve biopsy. It was a serial nerve biopsy. What was surprising is that uh, the amplitude on the nerve conduction study of this uh, sensory nerve was zero. But if you see, if you look at the nerve, there are not a lot, uh, the, the density of the nerve fiber are good. There is just a slight loss of the density of nerve. And there, there are features that you see when there is a dominating neuropathy because uh, the electrophysiology is poorer than uh, the aspect in, um, in biopsy. And if you look here, you can see that some of the axons are large with thin myelin layer. Look at this one. This one is very good. And so it is a dominating neuropathy. The treatment was very hard with this man. Here it is the RODS. So here it's normal, and here it's the dosage of the steroids. So the man was bedridden. He had a lot of steroid. He had plasma exchange, and the plasma exchange was catastrophic. And the 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 patient uh, worsened, and he had to to go in intensive care units. He didn't respond to IVIG. And we do the IVIG every two weeks or some, or every one week at one time. We try to um, prescribe cyclophosphamide. You see here three pills of cyclophosphamide and then rituximab. And I think that it's uh, thanks to the uh, cyclophosphamide and to the rituximab, you can see here that we were able to decrease the steroid and that the patient was uh, in very good health after this immunosuppression. Uh, here you have the follow-up for two years, but now I think that the follow-up is four years and the patient don't have any treatment and he had a normal uh, clinical examination. So we screen uh, this patient for antibodies against Nodafrandvier with Jerome Deveau and we see that this patient 
the serum of this patient stain the node, the node of frangi. So here you have the patient, here you have the paranode. If you merge, you can see that uh, the antibody stain the node. And uh, we see that uh, the, uh, this antibody was staining one neurofacin, but one special neurofacin, which is neurofacin 186. You have three different neurofacin, but only one gen, and there is an alternative splicing. Neurofacin 140 is embryonic. Neurofacin 155 is um, in the paranoid, and neurofacin 186 is, situa is, local is located at the node of frangi. So you have some fibronectin uh, domain, here it's a mucin domain, and here it's immunoglobulin domains. Antibodies against 155 are against the fibronectin 3, and uh, antibodies against uh, neurofacin 186 are against the mucin or the neurofacin 5 um, domain. After um, having this, discovering this uh, this antibody, we uh, we screened some uh, bank of sera and we found five four of the patients with this kind of antibodies. And if you compare them to normal patients to CIDP without antibodies or CIDP with antibodies against neurofacin 185, you can see that this patients have subacute onset, sometimes they mimic Guillain-Barré syndrome, and that uh, they are severe because the, the ranking scale is higher in this kind of population. Let's talk about antibodies against contact, uh, CASPER-1. CASPER-1 means contacting associated protein 1. There is only one paper from uh, the team of Summers and from uh, Catherine Doppler. Two patients, one patient with Guillain-Barré syndrome who improved, who was improved uh, after plasma exchange and one CIDP patient with a subacute onset, a dominating neuropathy. This patient was resistant to IVIG and it was improved by rituximab. Here you can see that uh, the sera uh, is staining the paranoid and it's merged with Casper-1. So it's antibodies against Casper-1. And there were one common feature between the two patients. The common feature was that the two patients had neuropathic pain. In the lab uh, with uh, José Boucro, we found one patient with uh, antibodies with a CIDP and with uh, antibodies against Casper-1. It's a, a patient from Garches in Paris. Uh, this man is uh, 53 years old. He had a subacute onset of his neuropathy, mimicking a Guillain-Barré syndrome. He had a sensory ataxia, muscle weakness, facial palsy, uh, a very high hyperproteinuria, five gram per little. The neuropathy is a dominating neuropathy. He had poor response to IVIG, steroids, plasma change, mycophenol at mofetil, and now they, they, they had begun uh, rituximab. The patient don't have tremor and he don't have pain. So maybe pain, it's not a clear specific feature of these antibodies against Casper-1. But uh, it's hard to be uh, uh, exhaustive because uh, nowadays well, we, do, we, know, we just know three patients with these antibodies. Uh, now in clinical practice, how to detect these antibodies? And I will give you an example of the French prospective cohort. How to detect? You can use T's sciatic nerve, I show you a lot of pictures. So this is a T's nerve, and you can put the sera of the patient and just look if there is a staining of the node or of the paranode. This is a good technique to screen a lot of patients. You can see that there is a reactivity of the serum uh, with anatomical structure, but this technique don't allow you to say that uh, the antibodies against contactin 1, Cusper 1, nor uh, neurofacin 155. Then you can use 
ELISA assay, and then you you coat um, the plastic plates with uh, the specific antigen, so you know uh, what is the epitope uh, recognized by the antibody. This technique can be available in most laboratories because ELISA it's a, it's a normal uh, technique used in the lab. But I think that it's better to use cell-based assay. You use transfected, usually it's HEK cells. Uh, so the cells are transfected with a specific splas plasmid and they are going to express the protein. For example, here the cells express neurofacin 140, here they express the neurofacin 155, and here the neurofacin 186. And you can see that if you put sera of one patient, this sera doesn't recognize 140 nor the 186, but you recognize the 155. And you can check that the staining is on the plasmatic, mem plasmatic membrane. So the expression of uh, the protein is more physiologic because these proteins are expressed in raft. Here you have a raft which are moving on uh, the plasmatic membrane. So it's a more natural expression of uh, the antibody than uh, the presentation in a plastic plate. In the lab, we choose to to use transfected cells, but you use a flow cytometry assay because it, it allows us to test uh, more patients than the only cell-based assay, and it gives us um, some, um, some data which are, uh, we measure some uh, obvious data. You can, you can measure the, um, the intensity of the staining. Here you have in, in green, uh, HAK cells which are not transfected and here in blue HAK cells that are transfected uh, for example with, anti with the contactin 1 and you can see that the immunofluorescence is the same in, in uh, cells transfected or not but with a serum of a patient who have antibodies against contactin this Antibody are going to stand with the transfected cells, and is going to um, to to be fluorescent because we um, we couple it with a fluorochrome, and you can see that uh, the cells which are expressing contactin are recognized by the antibody, and you can measure uh, the mean intensions, uh, the mean fluorescence intensity. So you have a number that you can follow uh, during the follow up of the of the patient. So in, in the lab in Marseille, we decided to, to use this, uh, this technique with flow cytometry, and we proposed to all the neurologists that wanted to send us sera to screen for antibodies against the node of front VA. We began two years ago, and now we have tested more than 1,000 sera. And you can see that uh, these antibodies are uh, not frequent because in 1000 sera we only found 90 patients with anti 19 patients with antibodies against another front VA, 10 patients with IgG4 against the 155, 8 patients with antibody against contactin 1, and only one patient with antibodies against Casper 1. This, uh, this patient have the same characteristic of. Uh, the characteristic which has been uh, previously reported. You can see if we compare this patient with, patient, with a CIDP patient without antibodies, that patient with uh, antibodies against another from VA have subacute onset, they have sensory ataxia, they have postural tremor, and in our cohort, we can't make the difference between patient with contactin and rofacin antibodies, both have tremor they have coronal nerve involvement, and they are resistant to IVIG because only one third of this patient uh, can be um, improved by IVIG. And usually it's no more than a couple of months and after uh, the IVIG are no more efficient. One special point is uh, that we have eight patients with antibodies against contactin 1, and we're very surprised to see that three patients 
add a membranous glomerulus nephritis, nephritis. And you can see that it's, uh, there are three men, three old men with a membranous glomerulus nephritis uh, proved by a, um, a biopsy. This patient had steroid, IVIG, plasma exchange, and rituximab, and they are severe. Two are dead, and one is stabilized by the treatment. So there is an association between uh, antibodies against contact in one and old patient with a poor prognosis. So this is a, a, new, a new data. In, um, in practical, if you want to, if you want to dose these uh, this antibodies, you have several uh, laboratories. You can send them to in Marseille in our lab, but you can do it uh, in Australia, in Japan. There is a lab in uh, in Padoue, a lab in Barcelona, but in Oxford and in uh, uh, in Dutchland, in Germany. When you have to to ask for these antibodies, there are some red flags. These red flags are subacute onset, sensory ataxia, uh, a marked sensory ataxia, a tremor for antibodies against uh, neurofacin 155. You test neuropathy against 155 if you are Japanese and if you, uh, the, the patient has central and peripheral domination. It's clear that you have to ask for this, this antibody if there is no response to IVIG. When there is a nephrotic syndrome, you have to think about antibodies against contacting, uh, contacting one. And if uh, there's a lot of pain, maybe you have to think about Casper one, but this is not so clear. So I thank you um, of your attention. I hope that uh, I was clear. And if you have question, I'm here to respond. Well, thank you very much for that, Amelia. I'd like to say if you have any questions at all. No. That's great, no problem. Well, then we can end the webinar here. Um, I'll be uploading the webinar onto the EuroNMD website um, along with the presentation, if that's okay. I have a question for Emilia, and here's the question from Milan. Hi, Emilia. Hello. Thank you for this uh, nice uh, talk. Very, very useful. Um, do you see patients with uh, um, paraproteinemia showing these antibodies so or never? Not yet. Not yet. No. And not even with lymphoma or other associated disorders. No. It's pure CIDP. It's antibodies. CIDP, they just have this uh, specific feature to be resistant to IVIG, and, and you do them. It, it's not monoclonal antibody, polyclonal antibody. They are ORGG4 directed against the nerve factor. There is no lymphoma, no, no cancer. Okay, are all these uh, IgG4 subtypes? Huh? They are all IgG4 subtypes. Okay. In the first studies, uh, it was not clear if um, it was only IgG4 or if it was a bit of IgN and IgG of other isotypes. And I think that that's why the frequency can be very different in the first. Um, in the first study and in our study where the prevalence is just two percent of all the frequency but all the, um, the studies of physiopathology uh, were always positive with igg4 and not the other kind of uh, of uh, the other isotope of uh, igg okay thank you welcome Um, and are there any other questions at all? No, no problem. Well, we can end the webinar there. And like I say, um, the recordings will be available on the website as soon as possible. Um, um, just uh, as a uh, movie of the patient on the slide because I wanted to show you the, the tremor, but maybe it's no good to have a...
to add the face of the of this station on your website yeah that's fine so we can we can discuss that um over email if you like that would be fine yeah yeah also, also the video were very um, slow so it uh, yeah. uh, was not uh, clear the tremor i mean on the screen it, uh, it's yes it's always hard to Yes, during the webinar, it's video, difficult. It's good for picture, but video, it, it's, not, uh, it's not perfect. No worries. Well, we, we can discuss looking at that. Yeah, that's fine. No problem. Um, okay, well, thank you very much for presenting that for us.